Thank you. Thank you, guys. Now, even the last time I cried like that on the stage was after the shellacking that he gave me <laughs> back four years ago. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you all just heard, I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics and I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum in the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, today's forum speaker is perhaps the most compelling figure, not just in the Republican Party, but in all of politics. In only his first term, Senator Rand Paul was already one of the front runners for the 2016 Republican presidential nomination, and is without question the Republican who best connects with millennial voters across the country. Not bad for an ophthalmologist from Bowling Green, Kentucky, who won in his first attempt for political office in 2010. I should know. <laughs> for you see, this is not the first time that I've shared a stage with Senator Paul. From 2009 in August through May 2010, we shared many stages, from Pikeville to Paducah, from Covington to Corbin, as we crisscrossed Kentucky seeking the nomination for the Republican Party to the United States Senate. Now, when the votes were counted on primary election day, Senator Paul got a lot more votes than I did. But I think we both won that day. He went on to become a United States Senator, and I got to be the director of the Institute of Politics. <laughs> so in my capacity as IOP director, and for the last time here in the forum in that capacity, please join me in welcoming to the forum, Senator Rand Paul. You, Trey. I'm a little worried about this forum. You know, you never know where things can fly from. But I understand you guys are supposed to be very civilized, some of America's best and brightest, so I don't have to worry about that. But I, I still have a bone to pick with Trey. He had one bumper sticker that I can't forgive him for. It said, Beat Duke, vote Grayson. <laughs> All right, and you really have to understand, in Kentucky, they don't like Duke very much, okay? <laughs> and I did spend a few years there, and that one still gets under my skin. Uh, so, but I'm trying to make a comeback. I've sent two kids to the University of Kentucky just to try to make sure we don't I have think a... We're I think that we're fair. I think yeah, we're, we're, good. we're even on that. Yeah. Now, a couple of miles from here, you know, they, they dump the tea in the harbor. And some say, oh, just a bunch of crazy people upset about their taxes. Well, maybe. I think they were upset about taxes, but they were also s upset about the process, about how their taxes were raised. They were worried about their rights as free English men, mostly men in those days, but they were worried about their rights being infringed, so they didn't have the same privileges and the same ability to vote or not vote for these tax increases. It was about the process as much as it was about the tax. One of the taxes that came upon the our uh, forefathers was a stamp tax. And the stamp tax was a tax on any of your papers and the only way they thought they could collect it because people weren't rushing forward to, to get their papers stamped because they were pretty upset about it, one way to check and see if your papers had been stamped was to go in your house. But they had the tradition of warrants even back then. And so they said, well, let's just let the soldiers write their own warrants. And in those days they called these the writs of assistance. And so James Otis wrote repeatedly and, and for a, probably a decade opposing these writs of assistance because they were generalized warrants. They weren't written by a judge. They were written by soldiers. They didn't have anybody's name on them. They just went from house to house searching through your papers. It was a big deal to our, to our revolutionary fathers. It was a big deal to the American Revolution. John Adams said that the spark that started the American Revolution was James Otis and his opposition to generalized warrants. It's the reason we have the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment said that we don't have generalized warrants in our country. The Fourth Amendment says that you have to have your name on the warrant, that you have to identify what things you want, and that there has to be probable cause. And that the warrant doesn't come from a policeman or a soldier, it comes from a judge. We separated the police power from the judiciary. A lot of what we did in setting our country up was to have checks and balances. We did not give all of the power to one person. They didn't give the power to declare war to one person. The president can't declare war. He's not supposed to, or she's not supposed to. De declaration of war comes from Congress. But it was this idea of checks and balances. 
But when we were attacked on 9-11, we sort of forgot about all this stuff. We ran around in hysteria, pulling our hair and saying, take our freedom, take our liberty, we want security. And so they did what Franklin said you shouldn't do. You shouldn't trade your liberty for security or you wind up with neither. So with the Patriot Act, we allowed for the first time warrants to be written by soldiers, essentially soldiers, the police. We allowed the FBI to write them. The FBI now writes warrants to the tune of tens of thousands. I think the overall number is in the hundreds of thousands of warrants that are written by the FBI. Now, does this mean that I think the FBI are bad people? No, I play golf on occasion with my local FBI agent. We have this discussion. It's like, I don't think you're a bad person. The same way I don't think the president's a bad person. But I don't want to give so much power. I want that power to be separated out, and I want it to be in a balance, in checks and balances, so not too much gravitates. Why do I care so much about this? Why is it a big deal to me? Because occasionally we've gone overboard. About two weeks ago, I had lunch with Eric Holder, and they were telling me in the Department of Justice that Hoover's office used to be right here. And I said, my goodness, with the ever-present reminder that Hoover's office was right here, why wouldn't we more viscerally oppose allowing eavesdropping or allowing the collection of all our records, given what Hoover did? Hoover spied on 300,000 Americans, mostly people in the civil rights movement, also people in the, in the anti-war movement in the 1960s. We have had problems in our country where we've allowed too much power to gravitate. Many people say, oh, well, the NSA doesn't abuse the power. We're not listening to your phone calls. You're just being paranoid. They're collecting your records. They may or may not be listening to your phone calls, but they are on occasion, and there have been abuses. But even if there had been no abuses, I don't want them collecting your records for the possibility of abuse. We don't know who the next president will be. We don't know what particular pattern of bias people might bring into this, but we do know some of the things that have happened in our past. One of the other things that's bothered me in the last couple of years and that I've spoken out against is something called indefinite detention. In 2011, in our defense authorization bill, we allowed for the first time in our country someone to be detained without trial without attorney, without charge, forever. You say, that's crazy, I've never heard of that happening. It hasn't happened yet, and the president says he won't allow it to happen, but he signed the bill. It's not, not for me good enough. It's not about this president, it's about who may well use that power. And this president, above all others, ought to know what the government's done in the past. And it alarms me that he would sign this legislation. And if, he, if this president wanted to be a great president, he would have vetoed that piece of legislation. You say, well, it's a big deal, we're not gonna do it. The big deal is, is that we now can arrest people who they say maybe are unsafe for the rest of the country. So I had this debate with John McCain. Y'all had John McCain here the other day and he's on the floor and I said, my goodness, you would allow an American citizen to be sent to Guantanamo Bay for the rest of their life? And he said, yeah, if they're dangerous. I said, it sort of begs the question though, doesn't it? Who gets to decide who's dangerous and who's not? I've had this debate with the Wall Street Journal. They just say, enemy combatants, yeah, if they're enemy combatants, lock them up. Well, who are enemy combatants and who gets to decide? The Department of Justice has put out some criteria for people who might be terrorists, people who have more than seven days worth of food in their house. I met with some people who, uh, some of them were Mormon today, and I said, they'd have to lock up the whole state of Utah. People have more, more than one gun in the house. People who have missing fingers on one hand. People who have stains on their clothing are all things you're supposed to be suspicious. If you see these people, report these people. This is the kind of crazy foolishness and overzealousness we had in World War I when we had hundreds of thousands of people reported. We had people jailed who opposed the war. We had people jailed who opposed uh, selective service. Eugene Debs. The socialist, the perennial socialist candidate was put in jail for 20 years. Now, I have nothing in common. I like nothing about socialism or what he promoted. But my goodness, I would have stood there and defended a guy who's put in jail for opposing the war for 20 years. It took, it took Harding to get him out finally after 10 years in prison. He ran for prison with a number of his, his jail cell number and he got over a million votes. We have made mistakes in our past. With indefinite detention, I tell people, if you want to think of the problem, you want to crystallize it into one quick story. Remember Richard Jewell? 
Richard Jewell was the guy, everybody said he was the Olympic bomber. He was convicted on TV, he had to be guilty. He was a loner, he had a backpack. He looked suspicious. He was kind of nerdy. Well, that's right, he could be a student up here. <laughs> or me, I, w I was a nerd too, so I'm not casting aspersions. But here, here's the thing. Richard Jewell was convicted on TV, but he wasn't guilty. But imagine if Richard Jewell had been a black man in 1920 in the South. You see, the reason why we have these rules is because bias can enter into the law. Minority rights need to be protected. Individual rights need to be protected. And the thing is, is you don't, it's, you don't have to be a minority just because of the color of your skin. You can be a minority because of the shade of your ideology. So we do have to protect these things. We should protect against indefinite detention. And the president could have been a real hero. Saying he won't use the law isn't, isn't, a, great, isn't a great stand. He could have vetoed the legislation a week later. They would have sent it to him without it in there. But that's the kind of leadership we need in our country. And there are dangers to where we are on this. And if we let it go too far, if you let your phone records be scoured and collected and you just say, the government says, trust me, we won't look at them. Two Stanford students developed an app recently and they put it on cell phones. And this app sort of collects your phone data voluntarily to show what you can collect, what the government can figure out from boring old phone records. What they found is, is that in most of the people, I think it was 15 out of 18 people they looked at out of the 500, they could tell what religion you were. They could tell what doctor you went to see. They could, for the most part, tell what diseases you had. Think about it this way. The government says that your credit card statement is not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Now they say, oh yes, we'll have privacy controls and this and that, and we're not gonna read it. But they always conclude every statement by saying the Fourth Amendment doesn't protect your records. Your records are not protected. This is something that needs to be adjudicated. I'm fighting this in the court, and I want it to go all the way to the Supreme Court. But think about what's on your credit card statement. We can tell whether you sm smoke, whether you drink, whether you gamble, and how much. We can tell what magazines you read, what books you read, where you, you know, think about what's on your credit card statement. It's nobody's business what you do on your credit card statement. There should have to be an independent body, a judge. There should have to be probable cause. These protections are for all of us. I think they're very important. I think it's an issue of our age. I'll continue to fight this issue. And I hope you'll join with me in saying enough's enough. We need to get our Constitution back. Thank you very much. For those who are veterans of the Forum Union, now is the time to bring all of you into the discussion. We have four microphones, two on the floor and two in the boxes uh, for questions. A reminder about our question rules. First, identify yourself and your Harvard affiliation, if any. Second, um, your question does not contain a long speech in the middle of it, or at the beginning, or at the end. Um, it actually must contain a question and does end in a question mark. And the third thing I'd say is, we've got a lot of people who want to ask questions. We've got a limited time this afternoon, so definitely keep them short. Uh, Jim, why don't we start with you and we'll work our way around. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming, Senator Paul. It's an honor to hear from you. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your stances on abortion and uh, how you see your role in that debate. You were talking earlier this week in Chicago about how you, know, you don't want to pass things that are outside the will of the people. And I was wondering how you see your role as a statesman and potentially as a future candidate in shifting the ground of the debate to more favorably towards your views. Right. You know, I think uh, when we talk about abortion, there are sort of a spectrum of where you can be on the issue. Uh, one spectrum would be that we allow no abortions without exceptions. That's not where we are, but that's what some people propose. Another end of the spectrum would be, I think, kind of where we are, that abortion is allowed up until the day of birth with very few restrictions. Most people don't realize this, but that's where the law is today. The law says that if you are one week before birth and that there's a health concern, but the concern doesn't necessarily have to be defined, and the concern could be that you're anxious or that you think you might hurt yourself if you have a baby. You can have an abortion one week before delivery. Does that happen very often? No, but that's sort of where the law is. I think that the American people are somewhere in between those. I am pro-life. I think there's something special about life. I think it comes from our creator, and that'll always be my position. Now, as a legislator, I've introduced legislation that reflects that. Uh, 
where are the people? The people aren't exactly there. And so I think there needs to be discussion and persuasion. But I think sometimes it gets dumbed down too much that we are in one extreme or the other and that our discussion needs to be more uh, what, do, what does the vast majority of, of the public want? And I think there may well could be incremental change, and I think that's most likely to happen. Okay. Up here in the box. All right, hello, my name is Jacob. I'm a freshman at the college. Thank you again for taking the time to speak to us this afternoon. Now, in your proposed budget, it only mentions the word stimulus six times, and five of the six times it's in a negative connotation about President Obama's policies. Uh, the only one, one time you mention it positively is about the stimulus that res result from businesses abroad benefiting from American tax breaks. So my question is, do you support uh, this type of stimulus that could still bolster the economy, or are you willing to, like Rick Perry did in 2012, decide that Keynesian economics is dead? I think the question is about how you define a stimulus. So for example, for most people think of a stimulus as government's going to send you some money and we're going to stimulate the economy or we're going to inject some money or let's say we're going to give a $500 million loan to Solyndra and we will stimulate the solar panel industry. I think there's another way to stimulate the economy and what I would say is is that you can send your money to Washington and then people in Washington can choose who they give it to and try to stimulate the economy. That's what we've tried. Didn't work so well. With President Obama's stimulus we had about an $800 billion stimulus. When you divided it out, dollars per job created is about $400,000 per job. wasn't very effective. Why? One of the reasons why I think President Obama's, or in general, the Democrats' idea of stimulus, getting the money, taking it to Washington, and then sending it back doesn't work as well, is because eight or nine out of 10 small businesses fail. So if I say, Mr. Smith, here's $100,000, go create some jobs, I'll pick the wrong person eight or nine times out of 10. But there's another way to stimulate the economy, and this is what I would propose. Instead of taking money and then bringing some back and me picking who I give it to, which with the Department of Energy loans turned about to be 80% of them were contributors of the president, what I would do is give it back in the form of reducing taxes. So for example, Detroit is struggling right now. Detroit has nearly 20% unemployment, thousands of abandoned houses, 50,000 feral dogs. It's a disaster. But it's been run by the Democrats for 50 years. My question would be, are the policies working very well? So what I would do is I would go into Detroit or areas with high unemployment, and I would lower the taxes dramatically. I would take the corporate income tax to 5%. I would take the personal income tax to 5%. I would take the capital gains to zero. And I would take the, the uh, FICA tax down two points on both sides, employer, employee. If you add all that up for 10 years, it's $1.3 billion. But it's not me taxing people in Boston and sending it to Detroit. It's just simply leaving money in Detroit that originated in Detroit. I think it would stimulate the economy more because the money, when you give a tax reduction, goes to people that you've all voted on. So in Boston, if there's a store that's succeeding, a Walmart or a Kroger or a Kmart, it's succeeding because you went there. So you all vote every day. That's what democratic capitalism is. You vote every day, and the people who succeed in business are the ones you, you, you buy their stuff. And so when you give a tax reduction, the people who get more of the tax reduction are the people who pay more of the taxes. What does that mean? I think you'd stimulate and create jobs because the money would go back to existing businesses through tax reduction. So is that Keynesian? You know, it, it, is, supply, it is stimulating demand, but it's trying not to choose the, the winners and losers. And so I think it's different than what has been offered, and I think it would work better. Up here in this box. Hi, my, my name is Kyle Welch. I'm a doctoral student um, at Harvard Business School. And my question is related to your ability to change the Republican Party. And I asked this question. I was on the floor of in, down in Tampa when they were casting the votes for your father to simply speak down at the convention. And I observed the the political handling of a situation that seemed very reasonable for your father to speak at this convention, and it was squashed by the leadership of the Republican Party. And so the question is essentially, do you believe, are, are you in, in the light to change ideology, or do you actually believe that the Republican Party and that leadership can change and adapt? Because it doesn't seem like it will. I think it's easy to be pessimistic when you see that, but what I would say is that, and what I've said repeatedly, the Republican Party will adapt, evolve, or die. They're not big enough. 
They, uh, they have to be bigger. They have to include more people. I tell people that the Republican Party needs to look like the rest of America to have a chance. That means with tattoos and without tattoos, with earrings and without earrings, black, white, brown. You know, you go to a Republican event and it's all white people. Not because we're excluding anybody, but we just haven't done a good enough job encouraging people to come into our party. We need more young people. President Obama won the youth vote three to one. But the youth vote's fickle. They're not all attached to party. And if you ask them whether they're happy about President Obama collecting all their phone records, I'll bet you we can win the vote in here on people. They might not necessarily go Republican, but I think if we ask people in here, are you happy about your phone records being collected? I'll bet you we get a 75% vote saying that people are unhappy. Then we have to say to them, listen to us on other issues. I don't think anybody gets to decide whether the Republican Party hears us or not. The message comes out. Republican Party is whoever comes on in the next generation, and that's what's happening now. Um, but the Republican Party, I will tell you from talking to whoever the establishment is, they are recognizing they need to be bigger to win, and they need to broaden their message, and it has to be a bigger party. We have an office now in downtown Detroit. We've got one in Chicago. We've got one in Atlanta. The Republican Party, if you look at the demographics, wins 80% of the countryside. We lose all of the big cities overwhelmingly, primarily because we don't uh, get very much African-American vote. We're doing poorly with Hispanic vote. You name it, we got to do better. But uh, I think people are recognizing that. And uh, I think that uh, if people recognize that and that ideas have consequences and that ideas will open doors to new people, I think there's going to, I think a change will come about or we'll keep losing one of the two. Valentina. Hi, my name is Valentina Perez and I'm a junior at the college. Thank you for being here today. Jumping off of your response, how do you think that the Republican Party uh, what steps can the Republican Party take to uh, appeal to these groups that it's traditionally not appealed to in the past, uh, specifically women voters and Hispanic voters? Okay. I think on immigration, uh, we need to have a, a different attitude and a different uh, policy. Um, some Republicans were talking about, hey, deportation, that's what our policy is. That's not my policy, and I think we need to have immigration reform. Uh, well, people then say, well, you voted against the Senate bill. I'll tell you exactly why I voted against the Senate bill, because it doesn't do enough. The Senate bill limits farm workers, agricultural workers, to 100,000. Right now, 400,000 come in to pick crops in America every year. If you limit it to 100,000, you're guaranteeing that there's going to be 300,000 illegal people coming in, because that's how many we need. That's how many are coming in. The bill also limited uh, construction workers to 15,000. So there's a couple million undocumented workers doing construction work. We can't have a limit so small that it doesn't encompass what the demand is. The other main problem is they say there's 11 million people here. Of the 11 million, they say 40% of them came legally but now have become illegal. Why did they become illegal? Primary reason is because they changed jobs. It is illegal to come in here to pick crops at $9 an hour and then you walk down the street and you see a sign that says $14 an hour for construction work. The Senate bill still didn't fix that. I think all of that said, there is, a, there is a compromise on immigration that could happen. People have to acknowledge, though, that Democrats, if they want it passed, have to be part of the compromise. The compromise will be, I think, finding status and a place for the people who are here, letting them come out of the shadows, let them begin paying taxes, let them not, being run, not having them run from the authorities. But it may not involve uh, the voting that everybody wants. Will that come someday? Maybe. But at this point in time, the only thing that will pass is something that would uh, legalize or create a, a bigger, uh, all, more encompassing work visa program. And I think that's a possibility now, but people have to decide. Some people on the Democrat side said, oh, let's just keep beating up the Republicans on this. We're winning the Hispanic vote. Who cares whether we pass anything? Let's just keep beating them up. And then there are some responsible people on both sides who would like to pass something. I still think something could pass this year. And, uh, but some of it, I think, more important than anything is attitude, that we treat people with dignity and respect and that we acknowledge that, you know, we were all immigrants at one point in time, that immigrants are an asset. And uh, you just look at, at this uh, crowd and see that you see many different diverse faces. What a good thing that is for America. Hello, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is John Acton. I'm a freshman at the college. And in the past, you uh, supported various uh, libertarian candidates uh, in a couple of elections. I'm wondering if in 2016, the Republican Party 
doesn't adapt in the way you feel it needs to and nominate someone who disagrees with you on issues such as privacy and what security should look like. Would you consider voting for and supporting a libertarian candidate who was more ideologically consistent with yourself or would you go with your party loyalties instead? I pretty much have always supported Republican candidates. I haven't gone out and supported Libertarian candidates. My, my dad did some, but I, I haven't so much. And uh, I think that uh, there needs to be, and I want the Republican Party to have a Libertarian influence in it. Um, but people have different ideas exactly what they mean to be Libertarian. I always say I'm Libertarian-ish, you know, and that, because uh, that still can mean we might, you know, there, whatever pure Libertarianism, there's some arbiter of that, but I'm, I'm probably not that. Um, but I think a libertarian twist or a libertarian influence on the Republican Party is good. But I pretty much just uh, stayed with the party and uh, plan on doing so. What about your father's? Uh, like you supported your father when he ran as a libertarian. I, I did. You're right. And uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. You're right. I did. And I, I stand corrected. I did. And I, I hope I don't have to. Uh, oppose him in anything, because boy, that would be, <laughs> so, somebody asked me the other day, what if your dad runs, and what if you, I was like, I'm not going there, all right? <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Max, I'm also a freshman at the college. I want to ask you um, about the Second Amendment and about gun rights. So the Second Amendment, as you obviously know, does guarantee a right to bear arms, but it specifies that there's a right to bear arms for a, rel a well-regulated militia. And in recent years, especially in the Supreme Court, it seems like that part of the Second Amendment has been largely forgotten. Now you have, I think, a perfect record from Gun Owners of America, so I'm wondering, how do you interpret the Second Amendment? And based on what reasoning in particular do you arrive at your interpretation of the importance and the meaning of the Militia Clause, which I'm sure you know the founders didn't just put in by accident? Right. You know, some states have actually taken this to heart and actually passed and defined what a militia is. I think Oklahoma has, and several other states have sort of passed and defined what a militia is. Uh, the people who go back and look at this history uh, say that the militia was, uh, wasn't really concrete in the sense that it wasn't. It was sort of like, hey, guys, it's time to collect our arms and go fight the king or whatever. So it wasn't so much an organized body as it was a collection of just the able-bodied, arms-bearing people. Um, I think that uh, our founding fathers were uh, less inclined to be for, you know, significant uh, gun control of any kind. I'm a believer that guns, while, you know, used incorrectly or used maliciously, obviously can be really uh, uh, something that uh, is, uh, that can be, that needs and, and needs to be feared as far as injuries or accidents or maliciousness. But at the same time, I'm also a believer that guns uh, prevent crime in the sense that there is a deterrent value. We have a country where we have some of the lowest home invasions because you don't know who has a gun and who doesn't, but about 50% of America does. And um, I think that, for example, these tragedies, I don't think any gun registration or control would have stopped the, the most recent one, you know, the tragedy where all the children were killed up in, in New England. I think that uh, those guns were registered and you know, they, were, they were gotten illegally by the kid. Almost all of these things that seem to have happened, the shootings, they're almost all young white males with mental illness. And uh, we do have to figure out why this is happening and figure out if there's a way to prevent it. Unfortunately, even the mental illness aspect of it, most of them haven't committed a crime or done anything beforehand. Did everybody know this kid had something wrong with him? Yeah, and people made terrible mistakes and his mother most specifically, and she, she unfortunately suffered the consequences as well. You know, there are no easy answers. I do think, though, that there is something to be said for these uh, crazy or mentally deranged young men are not going to the police station and shooting the police station. They're going to places where there are signs that say there are no guns. And so one of the first things I would do, and may not be popular with you guys, but I would I would put a sign up in, 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 in every school saying, come in, but, you know, we have concealed carry. We may have a security guard, and we may, may have concealed carry, but you will be opposed if you come in here. Um, same with our military bases. You would think, will there be a deterrence there? Most military bases don't allow uh, any of the soldiers to carry their weapons about. Are there some common sense rules? Yeah. I would think the bar on the base, you probably shouldn't have your weapon in there when you're drinking. But at the same time, for most of our soldiers are very responsible young men and women, I think there would be a deterrence fact actually to having them with their, having them walk around their weapons and if a person does make this decision, 
they'll be stopped a lot quicker. Virginia Tech shooting went on for hour after dreadful hour and had one teacher had a gun in their, in their drawer, they might have been able to stop it. Uh, so I think guns do provide a deterrence. Box right here. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming, uh, Senator Paul. My name is Reshma Ramachandran. I'm a joint master's in public policy student and a fourth year medical student. Um, I had a question in regards to some of your comments regarding lowering healthcare costs and the plans that you mentioned, such as enrolling patients into more high deductible plans and foregoing insurance altogether uh, in favor of out-of-pocket payments. Um, some recent studies have shown that these plans instead disproportionately affect uh, patients that are require uh, ongoing care or have chronic illnesses or uh, and also uh, shift the cost burden from hospitals and providers onto consumers. Um, I was just wondering uh, in light of this and the possibility that these plans would force consumers to choose between foregoing treatment and uh, uh, high out-of-pocket costs, um, how do you support uh, your rationale or how do you, uh, what's right. your rationale for supporting such plans and um, has your stance on the Affordable Care Act shifted in light of the recent Congressional Budget uh, Office analysis showing uh, lower costs uh, of the ACA and also uh, greater benefits for your constituents in Kentucky? Right. Ideally, if you went to a higher deductible plan, you'd get a cheaper cost. Unfortunately, under Obamacare, you have high deductible plans that still are very expensive. You also have some people who are being subsidized to buy high deductible plans, but it's still uncertain what's going to happen with them. If you can't afford to buy insurance and you have 80 or 90 percent of it paid for by the government, but you have a $6,000 deductible, what do you think the odds are that any of these people are going to pay? I think there's going to be a great disruption with hospitals, with people thinking they've got great insurance, and now you can go, but they're going to end up being non-payers. Ideally, the system would work as such. Insurance is something that what we have when we say health insurance isn't really insurance. Insurance is when you buy something that protects against a rare event. If you know you're going to see the OBGYN or the pediatrician that year, you're prepaying for your health care. You're not doing paying for something that's an insurance against like a flood or death like life insurance. Under the ideal system, what I would propose is not, and I've never proposed not going out without insurance. I've always said you should have insurance. I think insurance should cover against catastrophes, and what would happen is some of the lower dollar things would be out of pocket. You say, oh, that's terrible. People would have to pay. Well, the converse, or what comes from people paying, is it drives prices down. I'm an eye surgeon. I do LASIK surgery, and also uh, would provide contacts in basic care in my office. Neither one of those are covered by insurance, and the price went down every year for 15 years. The average patient who wants LASIK calls four doctors. They want quality but they also ask about price. When you have insurance, when you have a low deductible, nobody cares about price. So once price gets out of the equation, consumers don't make rational decisions, nor do they drive prices down the way they do in every other market. So what you do want is you do want to, to empower consumers and you want them to be knowing that what the cost of things is and participating in that cost so they will drive prices down. I think in the ideal system, when you graduate from college, or you're 22 years old or so, you'd go out and you'd say, I'll get a $2,000 deductible. And it would be very, very cheap, incredibly cheap, because you're young and healthy. Does this affect everybody? No, there will be some people with chronic illnesses. They are the exception, not the rule. So instead of making our whole system based on the exception, the rule is 98% of you will graduate at 22 and you won't get sick in the first year. You should put aside $2,000. Even if you make $24,000, you put aside $2,000. What should you do the next year? Get a $4,000 deductible. But you have to have freedom. If you allow freedom of insurance policies to be sold, then what happens is for 96, 98% of you, you'll go all the way to 40 without getting sick. It's an enormous number. And what you do is you'd go to higher and higher deductibles, but lower and lower premiums. But the only way that works is if you get choice. President Obama says that you are not smart enough. You are not smart enough to choose your own insurance. President Obama says you must buy this type of insurance with these things in it. So my 21-year-old son has pediatric dental coverage. We say, well, that, does it cover him? No. He's got pregnancy coverage. He's got fertility coverage. He's got in vitro. He's got all this stuff, but it doesn't apply to him. Why? Because the president says he's too dumb and can't buy an individual product that would cost him a lot less that wouldn't have as many things included. If you want a real marketplace, you have to let people buy the insurance they want. 
That's what you decide. Would anybody think that the president should dictate what kind of iPad you get? Why would you think that he should get to dictate what kind of insurance you get? You know, so I, I, you, if you want a marketplace, if you believe capitalism lowers prices and competition works, you want to go the opposite direction. We went to it. We're going towards a more of a federal control when really what we need is more of a market control. The old system wasn't perfect, but the old system didn't get better. I think the old system's gotten worse, and there will be a due. Pa bills paid on this. Nothing's free. There is no free lunch. Most people in my state, 85% of them have been signed up for free health care, Medicaid. What's going to happen when they go to the hospital or when these bills come due? The hospital's going to have trouble making money with that many people on Medicaid. It's a 50% increase in Medicaid for my state. So there are a lot of unknowns here. I think the president's well-intentioned and wanting to help people and have a goal of having everybody have insurance, but I, I don't think it's going to work. Okay. Senator Paul, uh, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, my name is Isaac Lara. I'm a joint degree student between Columbia Law School and Harvard Kennedy School. I'm also a member of the Harvard Kennedy Republicans, located in that booth over there. <laughs> it's not Yay. quite a phone booth. It's bigger for those who can't see that. Be behind the bulletproof glass. Right there. <laughs> uh, just a quick note before my question. Uh, I just want to express my admiration for you. Uh, you're the only Republican who's been able to actually go to CPAC, win the straw poll, and then go to UC Berkeley and receive a standing ovation. And uh, I think that's uh, illustrative of your ability to bridge the divide. And so I hope you uh, end up running in 2016. Thank you. Uh, that said, my question is, uh, since the times of Edmund Burke and, and Barry Goldwater, you've seen conservatism change with the times. Uh, and I'm curious to hear about your remarks on uh, how this country is changing demographically. My generation is becoming more uh, accepting of gay marriage and more secular. Uh, and I'm, uh, I would like to find out from you how you feel conservatism will evolve in the future to adapt to these shifting societal norms, and is that a good thing? You know, I think one way that it shifts, and one way it would be easier for us as a country to shift, is if we had more federalism in the sense that we left things up to local communities. And so what you would have is New York State, which has gay marriage, and you'd have Kentucky, which may not. Now, I think really you're going to get a uniform standard much more quickly because that's the way the courts seem to be headed in this. But I think it would be easier on society if we allow things to gradually unfold state by state in a uh, more of a diffuse manner rather than a, a centralized decision. People are going to be very unhappy if they feel like they're, have been, it's been dictated from another part of the country or from Washington to their state. That being said, I think, yeah, people's views are changing. And what I've said is that, look, I'm personally very conservative. I just, you know, I'm old fashioned on some of these ideas if you want to put it that way. But I also think that we can agree to disagree on some of these things and that there doesn't have to be a litmus test to be in the Republican Party, nor does there have to be a litmus test to run for, for office in the Republican Party. Uh, it doesn't change who I am and I'm, I am who I am. I've, you know, I've been an adult for at least a few years now, so I probably am where I'm gonna be on these things. But I am open enough to know that um, you know, my wife doesn't agree with me on every issue, neither does every Republican agree with me. And if we're very doctrinaire and we say, you have to believe X to be in the party, we'll have a real small debating society, we won't win many elections. And so I think we need to welcome everybody who wants to believe in some of the core limited government principles, you know, that, that the Republican Party believes in, and that the greatest amount of wealth and jobs is created by a, a, a small government with great freedom in the marketplace. Back over here. Hi, my name is Neil Sridan. I'm an incoming master's student here at the Kennedy School. Thank you for coming and talking with us today. Starting with then Senator Obama's decision to forego public financing in his 2008 presidential run, and continuing with the Supreme Court's campaign finance ruling since, study after study has found the influence of money in American politics growing at a rapid rate. As a prospective presidential candidate yourself, it is estimated that a campaign will need to raise upwards of a billion dollars to be competitive in the general election. What is your opinion on the state of money in our political system? And if you consider it to be a problem, what is your plan to fix it? Thank you. Yes, I think money is a problem and it is a corrupting influence. The other thing that I think is a corrupting influence is the revolving door between Wall Street sometimes and government and then back to Wall Street. And so I think there should be limitations on uh, former officials, what they can do going back in uh, and influencing and vice versa. You know, it, it goes both ways. You can go from being a government contractor into government back to being a government contractor. And I think there are potential conflicts of interest. 
However, I agree with Citizens United in the sense that I don't think you can restrict speech. I think paid speech is the same. For example, the uh, Boston Globe has a lot more power in speaking than, than I do. And they get to print stuff every day, but they own the paper that costs millions of dollars and they got to employ people, but they have more speech than I do. But we don't limit theirs and no one would dream of limiting the Boston Globe. But if I can only get my speech by buying an ad in the Boston Globe or buying an ad on TV, speech is exactly the same as far as I'm concerned. However, the way I would fix it, and most of this has been struck down. You know, there have been five, four decisions, but most of these things have been struck down, McCain, Feingold, et cetera. I think there's a way to fix this that would be constitutional. What I would do is make all government contracts have a clause in them that limit your either contributions or political activities. An analogy would be in the military. When you join the military, you join voluntarily. We have an all-volunteer military, but you accept certain restrictions. They have more restrictions than the rest of us do about their living arrangements and everything else, but also about campaigning. They can't campaign in uniform. There are restrictions on our military. I think if you get a $10 billion defense contract, I think there should be some limitations because I don't like the idea of you getting a contract and then you take your first million, you buy a lobbyist, and then you lobby for more money with the money I just gave you. But in order to get it passed and to make it consistent, I would make it on big business contractors, but also the unions. If it were big business and the unions who do any government work, I would have them sign in the contract saying that they're voluntarily giving up some uh, activities. I think it would be upheld by the Constitution because it wouldn't be mandatory. And the pun punishment would be you don't get your contract. If you don't want the contract and you don't want the government money, do anything you want. If you want the government money, you accept certain restrictions. Would that fix the problem? No, but I think it might help. Here, Mr. Fox, please. Hey, thank you for uh, speaking with us today. My name is Anish Mehta. I'm also a first year Kennedy School student and um, starting my fourth year of med school in about a month. So I admire your career in medicine and public service. Um, as you mentioned, Kentucky is one of the most successful states um, in terms of rolling out Obamacare. Uh, 400,000 in the exchanges, about 300,000 of those um, in, med in Medicaid. Uh, if you were successful in repealing Obamacare, as you uh, have supported, what would be your explanation to those um, constituents who would be, re who would, who would be losing uh, health insurance uh, as a result of that? Right. I think it's going to be difficult to uh, turn the clock back. You know, people get assumed and accustomed to receiving things, particularly things that they get for free. But there are costs to what's for free. So the question is, what will happen and who's going to bear those costs? And will the cost bring down local hospitals? Will they bring down government? State governments don't have a printing press. Uh, and so they are much more restricted on where their money comes from. The federal government has a printing press, but we're also reaching limits at $17 trillion where there are ramifications of so much borrowing because it devalues your currency. Who does the devaluation of the currency hurt most? Working class, poor, people on fixed income, senior citizens, because they can't increase their income to make up for lost purchasing power. What will happen? We would have to get, see we got to an extraordinary point in our history to get Obamacare. We had 60 Democrat senators, we had a Democrat president and a Democrat house. In order to completely undo it, to go back to where there, was, there is no Obamacare, you'd have to have 60 Republican senators, or pretty close probably with some Democrat help, Republican president and a Republican house. So uh, while I am for undoing it, I would go the opposite way though to try to help people. It's difficult once people become accustomed to things. What I think one of the practical things you might be able to do, and I think the public at large might accept this, is to make Obamacare voluntary. You make it voluntary, basically you get rid of the coercion. Right now the government tells you what kind of insurance you can buy and you can't buy anything unless they approve of it. Let's uh, say that we're gonna make it voluntary and see, does that get rid of the subsidies? Not necessarily, and or, and or the Medicaid. But the thing is, is I think also we're gonna find out we can't afford to have everybody on Medicaid. We can't afford to have everybody on subsidized insurance. I think that the, so there are repercussions. Right now a lot of people are graduating, you may have heard, with big loans and debt. As they're graduating with all this debt, there aren't any jobs, or the jobs don't pay for the debt. And uh, part of the consequence of that is because your government's soaking up so much of the money, you know, because so much is going into uh, enterprises that the government funds and to debt. Some people estimate as many as a million jobs a year are being lost simply because of the burden of our debt. Um, so ultimately, yes, I'm for getting rid of Obamacare. I'd get rid of the whole thing if I had the votes but we have to figure out how we would help those people in another manner. 
For example, I've been proposing for 20 years that poor people, you should give physicians a uh, tax credit for seeing them. In fact, I'd give you the choice. It used to be that I only saw about 5% of my patients were Medicaid. Let me choose either to bill the government for that or not bill at all and just take a tax deduction. Also, why not give the doctor a tax deduction if people come in and don't pay? If you, if you sell stuff and you have non-payers, you write it off from your business and you can deduct it. A doctor sees, if I see 10 patients a week who don't pay, I can't write that off. So I spent that time and expected that payment and, and, and got rid of people who would have paid to see those people. Why not allow people a, a tax benefit for seeing the poor? Ultimately, it'd be a lot cheaper. Instead of sending the money to your state capital and then back in the form of Medicaid to the doctor, you just give the doctor a tax deduction. We had a problem when we had about 15 million people, maybe uh, actually it was more like 40, 45 million people without insurance. If you were to break it down and look at that problem and figure it out, there were other ways of doing it other than turning the whole system upside down, which is what we're doing. That's why I know a lot of people don't know what's going to happen from what we've done because it's such a, uh, you know, a dramatic change in our insurance. But of the, of the 45 million people, about a third of those were people who made between 50 and $75,000 a year. They were young and healthy and chose not to get insurance because of the expense. I think what we're going to find is a lot of those people still aren't getting it because of the expense and that if we get to November, the president's moved it back beyond the election, when people enroll in November, I think we're going to find the price goes up again and it's more of a disincentive for the young people to buy it. There's so many unknowns, but there were other ways, I think, of figuring out how to provide health care for people at a cheap rate other than the government doing everything. We're going to have time for one more question. And then with your apologies to you, I'm going to editorialize and let this gentleman's a Kentuckian. I'll let McGum ask the last question. Sorry. I actually don't know what you're going to ask, so, so don't let me down here, McGum. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, I'm McGum. I'm a sophomore at the, the college, and uh, I'm from Kentucky. I live eight years in Bowling Green. Um, so my question was, uh, I think it's a pretty non-controversial statement to say that Washington has gotten really polarized over the years. Um, where do you see your role in uh, both both inside of the Republican Party building compromise as well as uh, with both parties or nationally? I think the way to make Washington less dysfunctional and get more done is to break the problems down into narrower bills and narrower topics. So for example, everybody says, we've got to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Well, comprehensive means a lot of stuff, a lot of moving parts, and we don't agree on all of them. So why not try to pick them up individually at a time, like the STEM visas, science and technology visas, people with advanced degrees, some of them probably here in this audience. 90% of Congress is for that, and yet we can't get a vote on that because they want us to vote on comprehensive. Uh, taxes. Taxes are very complicated as far as uh, tax reform, getting everybody to agree on who gets a little bit more taxation, who's going to get a little bit less taxation. But if we narrow the focus, for example, there's one bill that I am working with the Democratic leadership on, I would like to pass. Right now, money that's earned by American corporations overseas, for it to come home, it has to come home at 35%. They already pay income tax in Ireland, England, Europe, wherever they are. Apple has $180 billion overseas. Rather than bring any of it home, they borrowed money at 2%, rather than pay 35%. What I'm proposing is let's tax it at 5% when it comes home, and then let's put it all into infrastructure. We don't have enough money for roads and bridges because the gas tax isn't enough to pay for everything we want. If you take this 5% tax, which is a lowered rate, but actually increases revenue, it would bring between 20 and $30 billion a year in revenue home. We put that into bridges. But the way we pass it is, let's don't waste our time talking about tax reform, which is a thousand moving pieces. Let's pass this one. And then once we're done with that, let's say, you know what? Our corporate income tax is 35%, Canada's is 15 why don't we lower our corporate income tax to be more competitive with the rest of the world so we don't lose jobs overseas? Let's do that. And maybe just make the bills more narrow. It's kind of like this audience, 5% uh, Republican, 10% Republican. This audience, oh, I'm sorry. Let's say this audience, but, but we have a bunch of different opinions. And we, if we wanted to agree to something, if we only agreed on two, why don't we sit down and hammer out the two we agree on and pass them? That's not even happening in Washington. So I would say let's try to find areas of agreement and pass those, but make the bills more narrow so we can do it. Well, I'm sorry to all the folks Thanks who wanted to ask name. questions, but the senator's got a really tight schedule, uh, so please join me in thanking him for coming to the house. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks. 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 Thanks.
and the same ability to vote or not vote for these tax increases. It was about the process as much as it was about the tax. One of the taxes that came upon the, our uh, forefathers was a stamp tax. And the stamp tax was a tax on any of your papers, and the only way they thought they could collect it, because people weren't rushing forward to, to get their papers stamped because they were pretty upset about it, one way to check and see if your papers had been stamped was to go in your house. But they had the tradition of warrants even back then. And so they said, well, let's just let the soldiers write their own warrants. And in those days, they called these the writs of assistance. And so James Otis wrote repeatedly and, and for a, probably a decade opposing these writs of assistance because they were generalized warrants. They weren't written by a judge. They were written by soldiers. They didn't have anybody's name on them. They just went from house to house searching through your papers. It was a big deal to our, to our revolutionary fathers. It was a big deal to the American Revolution. John Adams said that the spark that started the American Revolution was James Otis and his opposition to generalized warrants. It's the reason we have the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment said that we don't have generalized warrants in our country. The Fourth Amendment says that you have to have your name on the warrant, that you have to identify what things you want, and that there has to be probable cause. And that the warrant doesn't come from a policeman or a soldier, it comes from a judge. We separated the police power from the judiciary. A lot of what we did in setting our country up was to have checks and balances. We did not give all of the power to one person. They didn't give the power to declare war to one person. The president can't declare war, he's not supposed to, or she's not supposed to. De declaration of war comes from Congress. But it was this idea of checks and balances. But when we were attacked on 9-11, we sort of forgot about all this stuff. We ran around in hysteria, pulling our hair and saying, take our freedom, take our liberty, we want security. And so they did what Franklin said you shouldn't do. You shouldn't trade your liberty for security or you wind up with neither. So with the Patriot Act, we allowed for the first time warrants to be written by soldiers, essentially soldiers, the police. We allowed the FBI to write them. The FBI now writes warrants to the tune of tens of thousands. I think the overall number is in the hundreds of thousands of warrants that are written by the FBI. Now, does this mean that I think the FBI are bad people? No, I play golf on occasion with my local FBI agent. We have this discussion. It's like, I don't think you're a bad person, the same way I don't think the president's a bad person. But I don't want to give so much power. I want Thank you. Thank you, guys. Now, even the last time I cried like that on the stage was after the shellacking that he gave me <laughs> back four years ago. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. As you all just heard, I'm Trey Grayson. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics and I want to welcome everybody to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum in the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, today's forum speaker is perhaps the most compelling figure, not just in the Republican Party, but in all of politics. In only his first term, Senator Rand Paul was already one of the front runners for the 2016 Republican presidential nomination, and is without question the Republican who best connects with millennial voters across the country. Not bad for an ophthalmologist from Bowling Green, Kentucky, who won in his first attempt for political office in 2010. I should know. <laughs> for you see, this is not the first time that I've shared a stage with Senator Paul. From 2009 in August through May 2010, we shared many stages, from Pikeville to Paducah, from Covington to Corbin, as we crisscrossed Kentucky seeking the nomination for the Republican Party to the United States Senate. Now, when the votes were counted on primary election day, Senator Paul got a lot more votes than I did. But I think we both won that day. He went on to become a United States Senator, and I got to be the director of the Institute of Politics. I want that power to be separated out, and I want it to be in a balance, in checks and balances, so not too much gravitates. Why do I care so much about this? Why is it a big deal to me? Because occasionally we've gone overboard. About two weeks ago, I had lunch with Eric Holder, and they were telling me in the Department of Justice that Hoover's office used to be right here. And I said, my goodness, with the ever-present reminder that Hoover's office was right here, why wouldn't we m more viscerally oppose 
allowing eavesdropping or allowing the collection of all our records, given what Hoover did. Hoover spied on 300,000 Americans, mostly people in the civil rights movement, also people in the, in the anti-war movement in the 1960s. We have had problems in our country where we've allowed too much power to gravitate. Many people say, oh, well, the NSA doesn't abuse the power. We're not listening to your phone calls. You're just being paranoid. They're collecting your records. They may or may not be listening to your phone calls, but they are on occasion, and there have been abuses. But even if there had been no abuses, I don't want them collecting your records for the possibility of abuse. We don't know who the next president will be. We don't know what particular pattern of bias people might bring into this, but we do know some of the things that have happened in our past. One of the other things that's bothered me in the last couple of years and that I've spoken out against is something called indefinite detention. <laughs> So in my capacity as IOP director, and for the last time here in the forum in that capacity, please join me in welcoming to the forum, Senator Rand Paul. Thank you, Trey. I'm a little worried about this forum. You know, you never know where things can fly from. But I understand you guys are supposed to be very civilized, some of America's best and brightest, so I don't have to worry about that. But I, I still have a bone to pick with Trey. He had one bumper sticker that I can't forgive him for. <laughs> it said, beat Duke, vote Grayson. <laughs> All right, and you really have to understand, in Kentucky, they don't like Duke very much, okay? <laughs> and I did spend a few years there, and that one still gets under my skin. <laughs> uh, so, but I'm trying to make a comeback. I've sent two kids to the University of Kentucky just to try to make sure we don't I have any. I think we're fair. I think, we're, I think yeah, we're, we're, good. we're even on that. Yeah. Now, a couple of miles from here, you know, they, they dump the tea in the harbor. And some say, oh, just a bunch of crazy people upset about their taxes. Well, maybe. I think they were upset about taxes. But they were also upset about the process, about how their taxes were raised. They were worried about their rights as free English men, mostly men in those days. But they were worried about their rights.